I genuinely and as a whole like James Bond films. I like the exotic babes, ever thwarted lead dwelling supervillains, a high standard of gentleman suiting, big and unlikely explosions, dry quips, medium dry martinis, improbable personal technologies, and the, the indomitable will of a resourceful individual to take in all that life has to offer. The refusal of which is my chief issue with dour Daniel Craig, that plus his horrid Tom Ford suits, being that which will triumph in the end. And of course there's the songs. The themes to Bond films have in themselves become iconic, sometimes capturing the zeitgeist in the most concrete of ways, for just as the movies are very much fixed to their time and place as are the songs, the cocky strut of Thunderball matching the pulsing beat of mid-60s Britain and the disco inflections of both the Spy Who Loved Me score and Moonraker's title tracks representing the exciting onrush of early 70s dance music and its decline into AOR by the end of the decade. The blandishments of the mid-90s themes reminding us as well that that was the decade when style and brand came to dominate substance. And this is our little exercise to gather up 24 themes to date and rank them worst to best. While commentary on the film that spawned them is inevitable, this isn't a ranking of the movies. That would be a very different list. I've decided not to include No Time to Die because the movie isn't out yet. My initial impression, however, is one of bewilderment. Billie Eilish appears to be making no attempt to actually sing the song, just her usual shtick of emitting a droning nasal mumble. I don't know whether that is to contextualise us or it's just a continuation of Billie Eilish in fact being a little bit shit. So, grab a plate of biscuits, given the opening scene of Dr. No is in Kingston, perhaps Kingston's would be appropriate, and a cool beverage and enjoy. I'd love to hear your thoughts and see your corrections to the list. Number 24. Writings on the Wall by Sam Smith. From 2015's Turgid Spectre, Smith delivers this seemingly unending dirge that fails to build any tension around or anticipation for the film to follow. A singer with a notable vocal range but not the slightest clue what to do with it, Smith goes on and on with his whining, pathetic caterwauling until mercifully it ends. Oddly, even at its seeming epic length, it's still shorter than Adele's Skyfall, but Sam Smith, he ain't no Adele. Far from it. Number 23, The Man with the Golden Gun by Lulu. 1974's eponymous film brought us, along with a wonderful performance from Christopher Lee, a less than stellar song from Lulu. Its arrangement sounds like poor show band disco, its lyrics are laughable, and Lulu, while giving it a fair hard crack, can't really measure up to the great theme singers of the past. Number 22, Tomorrow Never Dies by Sheryl Crow. From a film which always seems to be a little more likeable each time one watches it, comes a song that makes a little less sense every time one listens to it. Crow's vocal seldom rising above what sounds like a drunken slur, drags largely unintelligible lyrics across a then fashionable mix of folktronica, David Arnold style trip-hop and cheesy strings. An unmemorable entry in the catalogue. Number 21 Another Way to Die, Jack White and Alicia Keys. An unprepossessing slab of Jack White by the numbers, which derives little, if any, of its personality from its putative partner Keys, it seems 
tacked on to 2008's much derided Quantum of Solace. Poor though as the song is, the real abomination in this film, and I will keep coming back to this, are the Tom Ford suits they stuff Daniel Craig into. They make him look like McGilla Gorilla. Number 20, Licensed to Kill by Gladys Knight. From 1989's, at the time, a criminally underappreciated film of the same name, the greatest sin of this song is its sheer forgettability. It's almost as if it was written for Shirley Bassey, but they had to settle. A little trivia, real MI6 agents do not have license to kill. Number 19, Die Another Day, Madonna theme to an awful, awful film that sent Brosnan out on an embarrassing note. It's hard to think of a single redeeming thing about the film, and it's almost as hard to find the same for Madonna's theme, except that it is daring and different. It messes with the formula in the most aggressive way possible. The Electro Clash production is an acquired taste at the best of times, and it creates an impossible to ignore impression. Number 18, Garbage, The World Is Not Enough. This is basically Tomorrow Never Dies, but with a better singer and a more Bond evocative strings motif. Shirley Manson certainly attacks the song wholeheartedly and can't be faulted for not getting into the spirit of things, but the song, like the movie, just isn't memorable, is neither conspicuously bad nor especially good. It just holds its place inoffensively and unmemorably. Number 17, Moonraker, Shirley Bassey. The least of Bassey's three themes, Moonraker is exactly the kind of discified big ballad that came to pass as AOR in the late 1970s. Bassey's vocal is sumptuous and searching, but the arrangement is too soft, too lacking in the kind of drama that announces the film to really be considered the highlight of an admittedly limited genre. The song, in fact, is much like the film, undervalued in the bits it does well, and Moonraker does have some quite good stretches, but disposable in large parts. Number 16, from Russia With Love, Matt Munro. The song that set the template for what was to come. The modern man, entrapped by the fold roll of modernity, seeks to wet his toes in a forbidden world, and at the time, no world was more forbidden to the grey flannel brigade than that behind the iron curtain. Matt Munro's silky vocal, purring over the end credits, invoke dreams of sexy adventures in dangerous and foreign climes. Its only sheer demerit is that, coming as it does at the end of the film, and it having been one of the very best Bond films of all, it can seem a little anticlimactic. Number 15, Nobody Does It Better by Carly Simon. The first authentic attempt to create a hit record independent of the film, this is a well-crafted, highly polished and professional pop song that requires a listener to make a connection between the subject matter of the song and the world of James Bond as they know it. Simon, like her predecessor Lulu, from a line of singers one may presume chosen more for their <coughs> marketability, than their pipes, comes up trumps here with the performance of a lifetime. Number 14, The Living Daylights, Aha. A nice enough song which still sounds fresh after all this time. What really pushes this up the rankings is the way that John Barry, for his final Bond score, uses elements of the poppy melody to weave into the main score. In terms of integration between the theme song and score, only the swaggering Goldfinger comes close. A very, very good film which uses its theme song to logically progress the top 40 ties that had been ongoing since The Spy Who Loved Me. 
Number 13, For Your Eyes Only, Sheena Easton. Originally slated for Dusty Springfield, the greatest British female singer of her generation was shunted aside for the up-and-coming talent of Sheena Easton, who was hot stuff on the pop charts at the time. And, sad as that may have been for Dusty, Easton paid off big for the film for her record label going top 10 worldwide and for Easton herself who gave a warm and assured performance providing one of the most memorable themes and establishing the franchise in the first truly pop culture obsessed decade with its own affiliated artifacts in this case a top 10 single and a memorable video number 12 Diamonds are Forever, Shirley Bassey. Here, Bassey's mastery of the dramatic ballad comes to the forefront and shines. Theme to 1971's genuinely terrible film of the same name, but it seems to get a pass because, well, Connery. Balancing the perfect pop sensibilities with the gravitas required of anchoring a film about life and death and diamonds and as much of Jill St. John's flesh as was permissible. Alas, the campy mess that was trotted out was unworthy of Bassie's high craft. Number 11, You Know My Name, Chris Cornell. Cornell gets it. Even though the song itself isn't the best song ever handed to a Bond film, Cornell, both as an instinctive and intelligent singer, understands how to flavour the song and set it up both as a preview of the drama to come, but also as a summing up of the rather superb introduction to the new Bond that we've just been given. Casino Royale is dated in some areas quite badly since its ecstatic reception in 2006, but Cornell's powerhouse theme would work just as well if they put it in the next film they intend to make as it did for Casino Royale. Number 10. You Only Live Twice, Nancy Sinatra. Another of the lesser films with a superior theme song, Nancy Sinatra pleasantly warbled this utter earworm one of the most widely covered Bond themes. The key to the song though is John Barry's bewitching arrangement. Strings and French horn gliding down a spiral staircase to a lush bed of guitars. Invariably in the discussion when best or favourite Bond themes are discussed, and deservedly so, it has transcended the films into a classic of that 60s easy listening niche. Number 9. Live and Let Die by Wings. Needing to pull out all the stops to introduce the new Bond, Roger Moore, the producers latched on to the most recognisable name with perhaps the exception of Elvis Presley in the world of music to write the title song. Paul McCartney was offered the gig even before the screenplay for the film was finished, so he had to use the book as source material. Initially, the producers wanted Thelma Houston to perform the song, but McCartney insisted he be allowed to, or that would queer the whole deal. Given his head, McCartney, with gleeful abandon, managed to bring off a hugely successful track that manages to reuse and amalgamate any number of cues from his multifarious back catalogue and still sound huge and theatrical and rock like a mad thing. It made number two on the Billboard charts and is one of the few records to have made number two and to be kept from the top by three different songs. It's a song that has woven its way into the pattern of the legitimate popular canon. Number eight, All Time High by Rita Coolidge. On this one occasion, we have to talk about the film before the song. Octopussy, from which this tune is taken, is in my mind the worst entry in the Bond catalogue, and it undoes all of the good work to restore the series reputation done by For Your Eyes Only. But the theme song, that's another matter. Coolidge, 
chosen head of Laura Branigan seductively croons the tune written by John Barry and Tim Rice, which circles the themes of the movie and the legend, but is never obvious. For want of a better description, it's a kind of female yacht rock or the female obverse to From Russia With Love. Contemporary reviewers were less kind, but I think this was a fine closing song in the AOR phase of Bond Thieves before they went chasing the pop powerhouses and the media crossovers. Number seven, A View to a Kill by Duran Duran. The first number one hit generated by a Bond film, a perfect collaboration between a band at the peak of its powers and looking to grow. The lyrics are completely crackers, but the push and pull arrangement and relentless bass make this a classic contemporary pop record in a symbiotic relationship with the film that spawned it. Each one enriched the existence of the other. Number six. Golden Eye by Tina Turner. When I heard that Bono and The Edge were going to write the new Bond theme, my heart sunk. When I heard shortly thereafter that Tina Turner was going to perform it, it became a case of my mind thinking it was a matter of pearls before swine. When I sat there in the cinema listening to the slightly schmaltzy strings over Nellie Hooper's spare arrangement as Turner rolled out her peerless bag of tricks over the song. I realised the song had produced the perfect mix of self-consciousness and celebration of a great Bond theme topped by a performer in absolute command of all her artistic sensibilities and a voice that took the franchise both backwards and into the future. While the theme is its own kind of timeless, the film itself has not dated well. Had they made it with Dalton as originally planned, it may have been a masterpiece, but as released, it seems to be more a flashy tribute to mid-90s conspicuous consumption and conspicuous manipulation of tropes and devices to evoke ongoing presentation of and investment in the Bond brand. Number five, we have all the time in the world. Louis Armstrong. When I wrote the original draft for the order of presentation of this little essay, I had this song from On Her Majesty's Secret Service at number one, and for no better reason than it's a genuinely lovely song and it served as a fitting end piece to the career of one of the very greatest artists of the classic canon, and I'm not referring to George Lazenby there. Add to that the completely different role it plays in the film and its completely different tone and tenor from the rest of the songs associated with the series and it makes it all the more remarkable. Number four on Her Majesty's Secret Service, John Barry. Barry's new theme, intended as a standalone intro to the Lays of the Era, is a mog-led monster that sets both the tone for the movie as an opening theme and weaves itself integrally into the main score. It's fresh, it's exciting, it's fast-moving and it's cosmopolitan, just like the superb film that it introduced. Number three, Goldfinger, Shirley Massey. One of the defining elements of the greatest of all Bond films, Bassey's theme is possibly the best loved single artifact coming from any of the films. Bassey, who was John Barry's girlfriend at the time, was already a huge star in Britain and her performance, which covers every point on the map between subtle and strident, captures the film, her boundless talent and her fearless personality in one magic swoop. Bassey was having so much trouble over the course of 15 takes, finding the breath to hit that last earth-shattering note. She slipped behind a baffle in the studio vocal booth, took off her bra and hit the note flawlessly on that take. A number eight hit in the US, the service's song did in establishing the Bond franchise in the firmament of popular culture is incalculable. Number two, Skyfall. Adele. Like Chris Cornell before, Adele 
gets it. She understands how her use of the media integrates with the filmmaker's use of theirs. She understands the modern context of the Bond film and the role that music operates in that, and that over 50 years certain tropes and cultural baggage have been accumulated by the series which is better and more appropriately referenced in song rather than in the actual film. In composing the song, she hits the note-perfect mix between the warm comfort of the past, which we hope 007 will restore, and the uncertainty of the present times, which we hope 007 will remove. But the song, dark, brooding, with a hint of mystery and mischief, is a high point of the catalogue, and well worthy of what was to prove the best Bond film at the time, in over 40 years. Number 1. Thunderball, Tom Jones. Everything that is right about Bond films, according to those of us who enjoy them, is captured in this recording. Everything wrong, according to the Marxist revisionists who hate Bond films and are apparently in charge of making the next one, is captured in this recording. There is enough machismo, enough swagger, enough Las Vegas poolside tan in this song to send Gillette broke five times over. I'm not sure what items of undergarmentry Jones had to lose to hit the final note on this one, but just as Adele in the entry before proved that guile and subtlety were key devices in the Bond singer's arsenal, Jones showed that raw power and a vocal sledgehammer could still propel you to the top of the heap. I hope against hope itself that the new Bond film is not as bad as they make it out to be. I certainly hope that it's better than Spectre. And I hope when they finally discharge Daniel Craig from active duty that they go with an actor, not a star, in the lead. Craig and Dalton proved you can do it, so I hope they have the courage to continue with that. As for the songs, who do you think we should be asking in the future to sing our Bond themes? Me, I'd love to hear Neko Case try one, and of course, we could always have Adele back. Who would you like to hear though? I'd cherish your opinion on the subject. Be that as it may, I hope you've enjoyed this wander back through 60 years, almost, of the music that's tracked the most successful movie franchise of all time. And while the current state of the art is unpromising, in this, as with all other things, reflection is always bettered by the fact that you'll never know where it's at, unless you know where you've been. Good morning, my Freunde. About three weeks after I made this video, I had to go and see my doctor. I had Thunderball constantly repeating in my head. I couldn't get it out of my head. It was just stuck there. So I went to see my doctor, and he said, Well, this is very interesting with the Thunderball in the head. Uh, do you have any other Leiden in deiner Kopf that uh, you cannot stop hearing? And I said, Well, occasionally it's... And at other times it's What's new, Pussycat? Whoa, 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 whoa. But usually just Thunderball over and over and over again. And the doctor scratched his beard and he said, Well, this is very, very serious. You have what we call the Tom Jones derangement syndrome, or the Tom Jones syndrome as we doctor types call it. And I said, Tom Jones syndrome? That must be incredibly rare. And the doctor said, nein, nein, it's not unusual. <laughs>